All right, good afternoon everyone. This is Heather Mansfield of Nonprofit Tech for Good. You've already seen my face today, so I'm not gonna show it again. And I'm here with Josh Hirsch in Boston at the AFP conference. It's an international fundraising conference. And he is the membership and marketing coordinator for Nonprofits First. And what I'm trying to do today is I wanna meet with a couple of folks that work with nonprofits and just get the story of the nonprofit fundraiser. The, the personal story, like how they got to start working with nonprofits and what they think about it and what they kind of advice they could give for people that are either already in the career or looking at the career. So Josh, thank you for your time today. I appreciate you asking me to be a part of this. All right, so let's start a little bit with, um, when did you first know that you wanted to work with nonprofits? Sure, uh, I had started out when I was young uh, doing fundraising through my temple. Um, but at the time I didn't you know, really know what it was. I was involved with a, uh, program called Camp Jenny. And what mm -hmm. Camp Jenny does is it takes underprivileged kids from inner city Atlanta up to a summer camp uh, in the North Mountains of Georgia and for five days during Memorial Day weekend it gives them a chance to have three meals and have an experience as a child. So I remember at 13, 14 years old getting on the beam at my temple and, and making an appeal to... And how was that appeal done? Was it print? No, uh, no, it was it was me just standing in front of them and in front of uh, the congregation. Of, old school, verbal. Old, old school, two, <laughs> you know, 250 people with uh, a little speech that I had recited. And I remember walking down the crowd and a woman hands me a check for $100. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever that I was able to move someone. So yeah. at that time, I didn't know what a nonprofit was. So. Do you mind if I ask how old you were at the time? Uh, I was about 14 years old. Four, so young. Yeah. yeah. Every Everyone in the nonprofit sector seems to have that spark moment. Right? When they're really young, where they realize they want to make the world a better place. And, and I think it has to do with culture. Mm -hmm. um, in Judaism, we have something called tikkun olam, which means repairing the world. So mm -hmm. it was always taught about sadaka and giving back, but didn't know what a really a nonprofit was at that age. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to college, I got my undergrad degree in advertising, was working for a year, wasn't really happy with what I was doing, and knew I wanted to get some more education. So I went through the entire graduate catalog at the University of Florida, go Gators, mm -hmm. and I uh, found a program called Family, Youth, and Community Sciences. So I met with the graduate coordinator after about an hour of our conversation. It was a right fit. She has offered me an assistantship position, so I basically went to grad school for free. Mm. I wrote my thesis and knew that I wanted to work with kids to give back, so. And why kids? I was just always, you know, as a summer camp counselor, mm -hmm. uh, just always, you know, I enjoyed uh, being able to mold the minds of the yeah. youth sort of thing. Right. And it, it was a great experience, you know, being in my early 20s and be able to work with uh, kids and, and show them the path of uh, what where they could really go. You know, friends that I met when I was, started going to camp at 13, 14, 15, were, you know, my friends still to this day. And we now have this community of, of people that are all over the world, but still connected because of this one thing, because mm, of Camp that's Coleman. That's really nice, yeah. And, and a lot of people there, you know, understood that whole concept of giving back because of it being a Jewish summer camp. Mm -hmm. So after college and then into grad school, I had a chance to work for the Jewish Community Center and down in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, running their after school program and uh, working with their, their youth there. So after about a year, year and a half, I was ready to move up and uh, become in the management role. And went and interviewed for a program manager position at a small little nonprofit. After our interview of about an hour, hour and a half, she says to me, you would be good at development and marketing. Well, I didn't really know anything formally about fundraising at the time, so I, you know, I gladly accepted. And, uh, and if there's any 14-year-olds listening right now, can you explain to them what development is? It means it's not begging <laughs> for money. No, it's it's making it's making a a potential donor or it's making your constituents understand the impact of their gift and how your story as a nonprofit can be their story and and what their dollar, hundred dollars, hundred thousand dollars can do. Mm -hmm. Because every gift matters. And to me, I really believe the most important part of fundraising is stewardship. We know that it's much easier to retain a donor than it is to acquire a new donor, so you have to say thank you. And today's day and age, especially with social media, there's so many creative ways and engaging ways to say thank you. Yeah. Especially with all these giving days that we have, like mm. through Give Local America. Mm -hmm you're finding out in real time who your donors are. So you need to thank your donors in real time. And that's a part of development. Absolutely. Right? So going back to this new boss saying, you're gonna be a development director. Right. Okay. Uh, so I was lucky enough to uh, be invested a lot in professional development. I'm always a lifelong learner, hence the reason I'm here at the Association of Fundraising Professionals International Fundraising Conference. Mm -hmm. And I worked with the local Children's Services Council in Palm Beach County, and they had a grant training 
never written a grant before, never had done a case statement. So I went to a half day and I was there for six hours taking you everything from how to do grant research, how to uh, develop your case statement, how to work on a budget, how to properly tell your story, how to uh, follow up with the, the foundations. And always my, my go-to when I do my research, because I always really had a very high success rate with my grants because of that research, because I didn't want to just throw darts at the wall hoping that one would stick. One would stick, yeah. It was, after I had done my research, and even though I knew what the application process was, I'd pick up the phone, call that foundation, and say, can you tell me a little more about your grant making process? Mm. And that was my foot in the door. Yeah. Sometimes I got it. And th that's a skill. I could never do that. That's why I just ran from... All of that sort of work, because you actually have to get on the phone and like schmooze people. Yeah, it right? is. Fundraising is a people, per, you know, it's a people business. Yeah. People give to people, and, and that's the truth. You know, we all have great causes, and here there's three to four thousand people representing hundreds, if not thousands, of different nonprofits from all over the world. I think I heard there were 33 countries represented. Yeah, I saw that at, at this conference. So, what makes you stand out from someone else? And it's about you as a person sharing and telling your story and making them understand how they can become involved with your organization. Mm -hmm. And fund that impact. Exactly, yeah. fund that impact, you know, mm -hmm. because not everyone has that dispensable income to give. So those that are philanthropic, and you can be philanthropic by giving a quarter. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be giving multi-million dollars to be considered a philanthropist. Yes. We're all philanthropists if you really think about it. Yeah. You can volunteer your time. You can give your expert knowledge, or you can give, you know, your dollars. So time, treasure, talent. Uh, it gives us a chance to all give back to the world that we live in. I, I kind of like that if we had more characters for a hashtag. We are all philanthropists. Yes, I like that. <laughs> so how long did you work at that particular position? So I was there for six months and then had a chance to join the Palm Beach School for Autism. And, mm. and what was unique about that is that the people that I'd worked with at the JCC moved over to the Palm Beach School for Autism as well and, and were in the part of the leadership team over there. So I had a chance to grow something organically and at the time our number one referral sources for enrollment was our Facebook page and our website. So this was early on, you know, right when we went from having your personal page as being, you know, your organization to where pages came about and we're going from Josh is doing this to now dropping the is and really when Facebook was starting, because Facebook is now about 12 years old, February yes. 4th is, is their birthday. You know your stuff. I and yesterday know. was Twitter's 10, 10 year yes. anniversary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, at the time it was an evolving medium and, and knew that we had needed to invest our, our energy because there wasn't any Facebook ads or any boosting posts or anything like oh, that. You, they were lucky to have you because that foresight 10 years ago, now you just struggle to even Absolutely. It, it, coming in now, it's almost too late. The the organic reach for Facebook, uh, the recent numbers I saw is 2.7%. Yeah, it's pathetic. It is pathetic because if you want to build a movement or build awareness of your organization, Facebook is not where it is. No, Face not anymore. Fa not unless you want to spend a lot of money. Exactly. Facebook is pay to play. However, the number one question someone asks you when you meet them, what's your website, what's your Facebook yes. page? Right. So you almost have to have a Facebook page just as a way to have yourself out there. Yeah. Create engagement, but I truly believe uh, there are better social media platforms to create that organic reach. Like which? Uh, I think Twitter's a great one. Mm -hmm. I, I say Twitter, you know, Facebook is what's happening, Twitter's what's happening now. It's yes. live, it's real time. Like right now in this very interview. Exactly. This is real, this is not recorded. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the largest soapbox that you can get on in the world. Mm -hmm. So with targeted hashtag research, and I always do my research when I'm crafting a hashtag, whether it's being part of a conversation yes. that's already established or wanting to identify my own branded hashtag, I like to do my research. So, so that's I, actually like just searching to see if the hashtag exists already. Well, A, searching to see if it exists, but a tool I like to use is called Hashtagify. Mm -hmm. I think it's Hashtagify.com. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool is you can put your hashtag you're searching. So let's use, for example, fundraising. Mm -hmm. So you put fundraising in, in as your hashtag, and what it does is creates a spider web. Yeah. So in the center will be fundraising, and out from there will be different hashtags that correlate to fundraising. So you can see what oh. other people are talking about. So smart. how you can position yourself with that conversation. And depending on how thick that stem is to the other hashtag is how strong they correlate together. Mm. So if you guys walk away with anything from this interview today, it's hashtagify. Okay, I even got it. I'm going to write down the note after this is over. Good deal. So w before this interview, I kind of asked a few questions about um, yourself. So I knew what to say when we actually sure. did it. And, you know, one thing that just made me perk up right away was that at some point you hit burnout. Yes. And I think everyone in the sector understands that. And it can either be extreme, like you quit your job and leave and backpack right. off to Alaska or something and, you know, disappear for a couple of years. 
or you just get a different job or change sectors. What did you do and how did that like how did that burnout happen and sure. how did you respond to it? So I was always a small one man shop running development, running the marketing because you can't have the left hand know what the right hand is doing if they're not talking. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, your communications department, your marketing department has to be in sync with your development department. So I had the fortunate, unfortunate, however you want to look at, to run both those departments. Right. Um, and I loved it. I gravitated towards social media, uh, communications specifically for nonprofits, hence the reason I'm one of the AF peeps, uh, which mm -hmm. is the social media vanguard for the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Would you say that again? AF peeps. How you do you, hashtag, how do you spell hashtag it? Hashtag AFPEEPS. -E okay. So AFP, Association of Fundraising Professionals, peeps. Um, and we're a ragtag group. There's about 30 of us in North America that we don't see each other except you know once a year here at, the, here at this conference but because of social media we're able to stay connected and it's a resource that I can reach out to anytime I have a question about development, communications, nonprofit professionalism, how to run your organization as a business because nonprofits are a business and I know that I have experts all over the country that I can reach out to and have an answer almost instantaneously. Mm. So a great example would be uh, a couple years ago, I was looking for a new CRM. Mm -hmm. I've used Razor's Edge, I've used Donor Perfect. You know, there's a lot of great ones out there, but I wanted to see what people were using. Mm -hmm. So I put out there, and we have a special group on Facebook called the AF Peeps. And on there, I said, "What CRM does everyone recommend?" I'm, you know, one of my coworkers recommended this one. What do you all think? And instantaneously, I was getting all these co uh, comments, replies back saying, "Yes, yes, yes," and, and that was Bloomerang. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bloomerang is a fabulous CRM. Uh, great customer service, very simple, easy uh, graphic user interface. They partner with Tom Ahern and Adrian Sargent, so they have got great research behind it. They, uh, what they create is kind of this like hot and cold score, so mm -hmm. depending on how engaged your donor is, mm. where they are in oh, the uh, solicitation process and uh, cultivation process. So it's, it's a really great CRM, but you know, there's tons of CRMs out there. You just need to find the right one for your organization. Mm -hmm. So with this group of you know, AF peeps, I have this family that I can be, uh, have these resources available to me at all times. See, that's great because I think w one of the criticisms that social media gets is that it's making us all narcissistic and isolated. And I feel that a lot of days, not the narcissist part, because I really try to keep that in check, but that it's noon and I'm not out of my pajamas yet. And I haven't spoken to anyone in right. three days besides my husband and my cats. Right. right. So it sounds like AF Peeps, even though it is an online experience, you, st right. and you get to meet each other. I think it's changed relationships. Absolutely. It's right? a community. Mm -hmm. It is truly a community. And in some ways, it's not the same as being face to face but you still stay connected on that human level they're your friends exactly and, and it's funny because I met a lot of them on social media before I met them in person and in you know in real life at the San Antonio conference mm -hmm. three years ago where I was a Chamberlain scholar oh. and to anyone who is a part of AFP is an AFP member of their local chapter and you've not had a chance to attend the international conference I highly recommend you apply for to become a Chamberlain scholar okay. you become part of this cohort where you will get your conference fees covered mm -hmm. uh, by the Association of Fundraising Professionals and it's a great thing to put on your CV to say you are a Chamberlain Scholar because you are recognized Yeah, that by definitely your... sounds impressive. Yes, absolutely. And the next next year's conference is in San Francisco, next which year's, is yes. even more of a reason to want to get on that, right? Absolutely. So after Twitter, what would you suggest? You know, it depends on really what your medium is, that you're, you know, what story you want to share on the medium. So we know that if you are a very visual uh, nonprofit, so you have a great story to tell. Obviously, mm -hmm. Instagram is a great one, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you want to use video because you have 15 second video capabilities. And you say, well, what can I really say in 15 seconds? Well, let me give you an example. So thank you, Heather, for making a donation to nonprofits first. We really appreciate your support. So that was three or four seconds. Yeah. So for me, Perfect. Charity Water does that. They do little mini thank you videos. Charity, right? we all, Charity yeah. Water, they always come up. We're yeah. like sick of it, right? Yeah. But they're great at it. Charity Water, <laughs> I actually used an example yesterday for, a, I did a session on virtual reality for mm -hmm. nonprofits. And mm -hmm. if you go on to Charity Water's Facebook page, a pin post they have at the top is called, a video called The Source. Mm -hmm. And it's about this little girl named Salam and the journey she has to go through to collect water twice yeah. a day for her family. Right. And it's a 360 degree video. Oh, so great. you're being brought into that immersive experience to see what it is like 
like not just to mm. read a story or see right. pictures or watch a video. It's so smart. But you're in her world. And, and that's it, virtual reality. Right. It, it's not the virtual reality that we think of from the early 90s where you're running around in a video game or something like this. Virtual reality is really now storytelling 3.0. So you can be that little girl taking exactly. the walk up the hill to get the water. Absolutely. Right. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be this little girl. So I'm going to donate $25. Exactly. This, this isn't fair. Let me ask you this. What do you think about Snapchat? You know, I honestly am not an expert in Snapchat. I think Snapchat is, uh, if you look at the demographics of who are using it, it's, mm. you know, you're 12 to like late 20s, early 30 year olds. So I know that universities are doing a great job of utilizing it. I believe you're interviewing Emily Reed from mm. uh, University of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. She's got some great examples okay, of Snapchat. I'll ask her. Yeah, they've done some wonderful things. Uh, but it really depends on who's the audience for your nonprofit. Yeah. Not even necessarily who are your donors or your constituents, but who are you trying to talk to? Mm. So if you're a boys and girls club, sure, I could see Snapchat maybe being as a way to engage with the families and the children there. But unless your nonprofit is geared towards that, mm. I don't think it's necessarily something that you want to invest your time in. Be yeah. Because, you know, most places, and if you're lucky, you're working in the communications department of more than one, but most of us aren't. So you need to budget your time, budget your resources, and how are you going to best maximize what you can do? So yeah. if I had to recommend the platforms to be on, obviously everyone has a Facebook page. It's just what you have to do, whether you know, you're know you gonna pay to play and boost posts and create ads, um, or you're just gonna try to you know create organic reach through your engagement. I think Twitter is another great one because it's just a chance to really reach out to people. So what I've had great luck in is identifying local uh, media professionals, mm -hmm. The press release is dead. No one reads a press release anymore. You're not going to get a story placed that way. Mm -hmm. But all these reporters are on Twitter. Yes, they are. Identify them. Reach out to them and say, hey, I've got this great story. You should think about covering it. And I've had stories placed that way because of Twitter, because of that conversation and that relationship that I've built with them. Yeah. I, I love Twitter. I, I really hope, um, I hope they get it together with, yeah. in terms of talking to someone from the nonprofit sector mm -hmm. to do in-app donations. Like they've got the cash tags. Yep. Like I would love it if they would beat Facebook, but I think Facebook's a couple steps ahead of them. So Twitter, if you're listening, you've got two people, two people here that could get you set up to be setting in-app donations yes. within two weeks. And, right? and, and next year, since we're in San Francisco for the AFB That's International right. Conference, we are looking forward to hopefully engaging with Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all these major companies that we know that are part of the tech world. And as Ooh, nonprofits, it's going to be exciting. It is very exciting. And as nonprofits, we need to utilize these services that you have. We're doing this interview right now on Periscope, which is owned by Twitter. So we're yeah. using your services to tell our story. So we really hope that we have a chance to partner with you all with uh, yeah. next year's conference being in your hometown. And remember, the nonprofit sector in the United States alone is a $350 billion, billion. sector. Billion. I think they always overlook us and think we're just those nice little do-gooders over there, right? But we're actually pretty serious and very good at what we do. And we could teach Twitter and Facebook and yes. LinkedIn a lot. And, and the concepts that, and as Heather says, the concepts that we can teach, they apply for the for-profit world, mm. but in the non-profit world, they're that much more important because we're limited on our resources and it takes creativity. And especially when you want to engage with your donors and say thank you, use those creative avenues to your best advantage. So we're gonna wind this down a little bit. There's two questions I have again. And again, I just kind of want to go back to the burnout. Like what, what is something that you were, were feeling? Or what's the, like when I hit burnout, yeah. I quit my job, packed up my car, left San Francisco, moved back to my hometown in Springfield, Missouri, right? Which I lasted there a couple of years. So my burnout was pretty extreme. Yeah. Um, what, like, how did your burnout? So for me, I was actually getting physically ill yeah. from the stress of having to raise X amount of dollars each yes. year. You know, I knew that I had a great story to tell. But it's hard to always be out there on the grind and finding new donors and keeping your current donors engaged. Um, but I always had that communications hat in my back pocket. I knew Did that you have any student loan debt or anything? So then you're not getting paid a whole lot and you're trying to pay off debt. Right. Just, yeah. yeah. Thankfully, my, my student loans were paid off and, and I worked hard to make sure I was done with that uh, by my early 30s. Good. Uh, so here I am now. It's like, okay, how do I take what I love to be able to still be a part of the sector? and. Luckily enough, uh, the foundation I was working for was good friends with the executive director at the current job where I am now at Nonprofits First. So she kind of said, hey, I know you're looking for a marketing communications person. Mm. 
I've got that person for you. So we well, all you're lucky that you, these things kind of just arrive. Absolutely. That's good karma. You know, you do good things in the world, good things it's happen. It's totally true. You know, we think that we're all fighting for the same dollar. And yes, there's limited funds out there and there's more fundraisers than there are dollars. Mm -hmm. But if we share resources, if we collaborate, we're going to be much more effective in our storytelling and being effective nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Great. So final question, thinking about all the wisdom you've gained through what the last 10 15 years and working in the nonprofit sector there's what, what's your advice like what's so, your number one piece of advice the number one piece of advice that I give whether you're in communications front house development it doesn't matter listen and engage with your constituents it doesn't have to be your donors it doesn't have to be your programs providers it's who's going to use your services hear what they're saying and make sure that you're responding to them don't live in a silo work in a silo and just think you know what this is the way it's always been done so this is how we're gonna do it no we need to be proactive not reactive what if you don't have the time you know like it, even emailing somebody going I got that con like I, I always feel bad because I'm Heather Mance from nonprofit org there's like a million people I get a lot of stuff yeah. and I can't listen I can't respond so like somebody said yesterday I've been emailing you on LinkedIn for two years and I'm like sorry I don't check LinkedIn right so like I hear that a lot like you got to listen you got to engage right. but even that is like so I use, yeah time. I use a couple of tools um, a great one and all free tools because mm -hmm. I'm you know want to take advantage of as many free uh, services as possible uh, I create Google alerts mm. so I'll not only create a Google alert for my own organization and you always want to put everything in quotation so it's a direct search and oh, as, as a, that's a tip. Yes, as a membership organization, as nonprofits first, I'll create a Google alert for every organization that's a member. Mm -hmm. So anytime that they are mentioned in the local media, I can then find that story and share it online as well. Great. Versus having to sit there and do manual searches. So Google alerts is great for that. Also, I use Hootsuite as my listening tool. Okay. And depending on what profile I'm managing at that time, whether it's my personal or the different organizations that I'm involved with, I'll create different streams based upon hashtags that I know are part of the conversation in that world. Mm -hmm. So I can constantly see what's going on with that. Another great uh, tool that I like to use are Twitter lists. So yes. for example, at this conference, I know there's everyone talking about this using that hashtag AFP. FC. Mm -hmm. So what I did using IFT, which is mm. if this then that, mm -hmm. I created a recipe and that any time that the AFP FC hashtag was mentioned, it triggers to then push to my Twitter list. So I mm -hmm. can now go back after this conference and see everyone who is talking about this and know who I want to engage with afterwards. Because we've right. been here for three days straight learning so many incredible things. It's like your mind's going a mile a minute, how am I going to take advantage of all this? So yeah. now I know who to go out and talk to afterwards and find who I want to engage with. Well, that's great, Josh. You know, one thing I'm, I get asked a lot is uh, what to look for in somebody when they're looking to hire a social media manager. And I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, if the person you're interviewing sounds like this, <laughs> this is what you're looking for. One, somebody with passion. Yes. Two, somebody that understands the tools, enthusiastic about the tools. Mm -hmm. And three, clearly organized, has a lot of mental space to manage all of this. Because I know some people who are listening are like, hashtag, APF, you know, right. if what is he right. talking about? But um, this actually makes a lot of sense to people who really enjoy the work. So increasingly, nonprofits are finally starting to come around to understand that digital media, social media, Absolutely. requires a financial investment yeah. and hiring of staff. So for the EDs that are listening, um, this is when you're doing the interview, the sort of stuff that you want to listen for, which is enthusiasm and knowledge. Well, Josh, thank you so much. Do you oh, have any pets? You. I always ask people to have any uh, pets. I don't have any. We have, a, we have a fish. That's not true. We have a, <laughs> I, I have a beta fish that's about three years old now, and it was a gift from a friend, and it sits on my you know counter, oh. and uh, every day I wake up, I'm like, you're still here? You know, what's going on? But yeah, that's no, funny. beyond the beta fish, that's it. Okay, well, then you don't have a lot of responsibilities, and you can just tweet your heart exactly. out. Exactly. I, I live with this in my hand. You All know? right. All right. Well, thanks, Josh. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it.